Hi there, I'm Dr. Jill Wiener. I am a physician, a meditation teacher, tapping practitioner, and aspiring anti-racist. And um, I want to—I have Dr. Melissa Hankins here with me. I'm so excited to have her here. She's a good friend of mine, a colleague, and also a brilliant uh, woman. And uh, I'm so happy to have you here, Melissa. She's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. She's an executive coach and a tapping practitioner, also called Emotional Freedom Technique. Uh, that's how we connected. And she now coaches doctors on perfectionism and imposter syndrome. And Melissa and I have had so many conversations about race over the last however long since we've known each other. And I'm just thrilled to have you here. So thanks for being here, Melissa. Oh, thank you for having me, Jill. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and to speak with your audience. And so I appreciate you asking me to come on. And no, no Zoom bombers this time. I know, right? Yes, yes. We've had that experience. Been there, done that. Don't need to experience it again. That Thank you very we, much. I invited Melissa to be part of one of my tapping support sessions during COVID. And it was this wonderful thing. And that was right when, right before Zoom, people started to realize how to take safety precautions and, and we got Zoom bombed. So luckily, luckily, we're not going to have to worry about that today. Um, so we're going to talk today about race, and um, Melissa, can you talk a little bit about your your background? Um, how race you have uh, everybody's story is unique, but you have uh, the, the events of your childhood have have shaped a lot of who you are and how you see your own um, race and how you've internalized racism. So I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Great. Yes. Thank you, Jill. Um, so I am biracial, and so uh, I was. Uh, raised by a single white mother, Caucasian mom, and my father's Nigerian, but he was never part of my life. So uh, I was raised in Utah, which if anybody is familiar with Utah, it is a overwhelmingly predominantly white uh, state. So uh, growing up in Utah was uh, an experience in and of itself, beautiful mm -hmm. state, beautiful state, um, uh, many, many wonderful people, but growing up as a child uh, in, in the 70s uh, and in very early 80s, but 70s primarily there, uh, I, uh, I certainly experienced racism both in the community, in my school system, um, and also within my, my family of origin. So my mother was a bit of a... Uh, outcast, shall we say, or, you know, black sheep, no pun intended there, <laughs> <laughs> in, in her family. And, and so she, uh, I'm, I'm one of three, and my sister, who's closest in age to me, also, we have the same father, and she has about the same complexion as I do. And my uh, oldest sister, who's 12 years older, she's um, also biracial, uh, but she could, uh, with the exception of perhaps her hair, quote unquote, pass, um, okay. which means that she could pass for white. You would never know that she she was uh, black, um, except for she's got um, her her hair uh, is more of an afro that she often straightened with a hot comb, um, okay. and uh, so. So for, for my experience growing up as this brown baby, brown black baby uh, in, in my family, there were experiences of, of uh, I, I just remember within the family, uh, a few instances in particular, I had uh, an uncle by marriage, married to my mom's, uh, my mom's sister, uh, who was uh, much older uh, than, than my mom. But he, when I was around five, um, he molested me. And he was a, a white male from Alabama. And, and uh, at the time that he molested me, he also uh, called me the N-word. And this is what you know, niggers are good for, and, you know, this kind of thing, and it was really, at, at the time, you know, you're taking this in as a five-year-old, and before the age of seven, you have no filter. You just, in terms of your, your uh, subconscious, everything gets taken in, mm -hmm. so, so I had that traumatic experience that, you know, being Black certainly was not safe, 
um, in, in that realm. And then I had another uncle who was actually by um, uh, an uncle who was blood relation to my mom. Um, I remember overhearing him uh, speaking with his wife uh, when I was around seven um, and just thrown around the n-word to describe black people and he I just overheard I don't think he saw me but but this was the kind of mentality within the family uh not my mom of course but but certainly you know these people she was closest to and then by association who I was closest to yeah wow and so yeah. so the trauma of being sexually abused and then which kind of sounds like the worst thing that can happen to a child. And then adding on to that, being abused emotionally about your race, combining yeah. those two things together at, I, I can't even imagine. I'm so sorry you went through that. And yeah, it sounds um, like from, that's had such a profound impact on how you've internalized your race. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I didn't recall um, the, the abuse itself until my adulthood, you know, we, we mm -hmm. compartmentalize oftentimes these things. Mm -hmm. However, I know that growing up, I was very much, um, I, I very much, uh, strove to be as perfect as I could be. And perfection uh, for me was really assimilating to the white culture mm. and being uh, as uh, a perfect white little girl as I could be. Uh, and I, I had the longing for the straight hair and the, the blue eyes, which of course I have very dark brown eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and my hair is not straight. And as a matter of fact, my mom didn't know what to do with our hair when we were little babies. It got so bad that she actually, I think we were like four and she just shaved it all off uh, oh, wow. because she was just like, I don't know what to do with this hair. Uh, because we had very, my, my youngest, uh, my, my sister closest in age to me, we had very, you know, uh, prominent afros. And, and so it was, she just didn't, and yeah, so uh, luckily my oldest sister stepped in, said, I will take care of their hair. <laughs> Just Aww. don't shave it again. <laughs> Just don't do that. To Please these. don't do that again. Yeah. Right. Because we were considered, you know, people, were, oh, you have such cute little boys, you know. So, <laughs> but, but yes, this, uh, I, I very, it's not that I saw a lot of um, black children or children that looked like me, even brown children in Utah. My elementary school, I, I, uh, I remember joking uh, as, as an adult, kind of looking back and saying, oh, you know, in my small elementary uh, school, in my small town, because I also grew up in a small town. <laughs> um, and on top of that, so in Utah, in a small town of Utah, um, and and uh, in saying, oh, you know, it was probably about myself, my sister, and maybe five other kids um, who who were people of color, children of color in, in that school. And so I would joke and say, oh yeah, Utah, growing up in Utah, it was myself, my sister, handful of kids in the Utah Jazz, you know, uh, the basketball team. <laughs> and so as, as people of color in Utah, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was for me, in order to uh, be accepted within my family, uh, I felt very much, and in society, I had this sense of I needed to be uh, as close to th the white ideal of perfection as possible. So, how did what 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 changed that? What experiences in your life shaped you realizing? okay, that's not something I need to aspire to, nor should I try to, or it's not even anything to aspire to. It's just, uh, I'll go with, <laughs> whiteness is, is, is related, but it's a, a whole road that we don't necessarily need to go down right now. But what, what changed in your mind? What experiences did you have that made you realize, I don't have to try to be like that, being who, 
what made you start to accept your own identity more? I think I struggled as a teenager, um, really feeling that, really kind of being in a sense of some people would, because of the color of my skin, would react to me as being black and and almost uh, in, in, in subtle ways. Maybe I would get passed over for uh, an assignment or people wouldn't want to work with me. And, mm -hmm. and this, in my adolescence, I, I, we had moved to Utah, um, I'm sorry, to California uh, when I was starting eighth grade. And so you would think, oh, okay, there, there are many more people of color there. And, and yes, there were. Uh, however, I was very much in the honors classes and so these advanced classes and a lot of my uh my actual classmates in my classes very very few people of color were, okay. were in those courses so so it was uh once again a and I, and I think this happens to so many of us who are of color and we're, we're in these, on these high academ uh, academic tracks that there just are not people who, who look like him. I mean, this happens still with my son who's 12. And he says to me, mom, there just really aren't people who look like me so much mm -hmm. in his classes. And so, so this is not something that, you know, has changed by much at all. And, uh, but I, I really was struggling with this sense of my identity, which we all do as adolescents. This is, this is part of a rite of passage in, in adolescence. Who am I? What am I supposed to be? You know, who, um, am I my parents? Am I not? And in really trying to sort out what my place is in, in the world. And I often refer to myself as an Oreo internally. I didn't necessarily say that to other people, but, uh, and, and that's actually fairly common uh, or certainly not uncommon for people who are of mixed race and, and you, you don't quite fit in with the white kids. This was certainly my experience. Certainly, you know, I, so I wasn't often accepted there in, in certain ways. And, and I didn't fit in with the black kids. And so where did I go? And who did I, who did I relate to? Because if I tried to spend time with the black kids, sometimes I would be made fun of, oftentimes. I remember my first boyfriend who, who was black when I was 16. And he... Uh, he wasn't, uh, he was, he was a, an intelligent guy and, um, but he also had a different set of opportunities and he wasn't necessarily, he went to a different school and he didn't have, um, uh, uh, I don't think he pursued things in the way that I did academically, but also his whole kind of family background was different and he may not have had people kind of pushing him in that regard. Mm -hmm. So, so in any case, I remember, uh, you know, speaking with him and him making fun of me and putting me down for my proper use of the English language. Mm. And, and that happened with several of my friends uh, or, you know, people I tried to be friends with uh, in the African American community. Uh, that it, I was looked on as putting on airs. Oh, okay. you're too good for us. Oh, you think, you know, and, and so it was really this sense of, I wasn't trying to do, that was just who I was. That's how I spoke. That's mm -hmm. how I communicated. But, but to them, it was, oh, you're, you're trying to be better than us. Oh, you're trying to um, make us feel bad about ourselves. And so then I was pushed out of that kind of community. I didn't have that. Um, and uh, so the times that I did try to fit in, I guess, so to speak, with uh, African American communities growing up, mm -hmm. um, it was, I was really not given an opportunity. If, if I did, I had to be something that I wasn't um, in, in ways that 
clashed with my idea at that point of who I was. I was this, you know, very studious, um, academically driven, um, viewed as, you know, highly intelligent girl on this track for academic success and, you know, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and yeah, so, so I just, I just stopped kind of being part of trying to be part of that community. So where, I guess, since, since then, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. right. As right. you're saying, adolescence is so hard anyway. Adolescence as a person of color is, you're going to add all that stuff, but now you have two identities that you're not feeling accepted by either way. Um, how has that evolved since then? Have you been, been able to yeah. find yes. more of a, a safe space for your own identity or how has I, that progressed? I, I, I have, I think when I got to college, when I got to Harvard, um, it was, it was actually the first time that I fell in with a group of African Americans or, or black students um, and felt accepted because when I first got there freshman week, I, I didn't come from money. We didn't have my money. My mom, like I said, I was a, uh, raised by a single mom. She died when I was 16. And so it didn't come from any kind of moneyed background by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and, and so going to Harvard, here I was surrounded by a lot of students, not all students, but most students who come from some sort of privileged, economically speaking, mm -hmm. um, background, regardless of their color uh, and, um, or race or ethnicity. Um, and, and, uh, so didn't feel like I belonged on on that level with most of the students and and everybody here was smart so I didn't so there was really you know there were kids there who were much smarter than I was and and so that didn't that wasn't a little group that I could you know go towards which I did in in high school I had my little little group of nerds we were all little nerds and we were proud to be our little nerdy selves and and then uh i remember standing in freshman in 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 the yard freshman week and seeing this group and feeling lost feeling really lost and like oh my god i made a mistake i don't know why am i here and seeing this group of um black students kind of come by and they, they said oh hey come with us literally they said oh come with us I love that so, <laughs> so much and so I was like okay <laughs> and so I went with them and that became my cohort uh at least in the beginning that was my first real positive experience of being included in a black community and having a positive experience of blackness basically for me that I could still be black be intelligent be uh, um, proud of those things that I held dear to my to my being of mm -hmm. uh, that I really viewed as this is who I am and and be accepted in that way and that was just a really new and wonderful experience for me and so that opened up the the path I think for me to have more of those and of course the the higher up you go you know Harvard and then medical school and then working as a physician and and so you're going to obviously those those are areas where you're going to have people who are academically and professionally focused and 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 that your intelligence is not being viewed as a detriment basically, mm -hmm. or, or a threat, uh, at least to a number of black people um, in, in many ways. I mean, yeah. there is some of that also. Uh, but then you have to ride the line of then the white side of, of, of all of that. Yeah, so talk um, a little bit about that. So, so we were talking about the, the balance never ends. It's this, no. it's this, it's this constant like, yeah, making of the different powers that be happy so that you're not too much of one thing and too little of something else. So can you talk about your experience? Yeah. So, so I think, uh, um, at some point 
in, uh, and I think as I went through medical school and certainly even, I was beginning to feel it more in residency and, and certainly as an, an attending physician, that, that sense of wanting to and feeling almost an obligation on some level to give back to the black community or to be part of, or to be, uh, to help rise up the, the black community. Uh, because I was in a position where I could, I had the ear, so to speak, of, of people in power yeah. who were major the majority of whom were white. And so, so I think uh, in uh, for th for that reason, uh, it it became important to me to begin to speak up about some of the the I think injustices or some of the these the racist kind of. Um, uh, situations that may have been very subtle um, that yeah. were going on. And uh, I, what comes to mind, I mean, something so small, something so small. And I just, I, during residency, you know, the, usually some, one of the other residents in your class, at least this is what was for my residency. One of the other residents was making the, the schedule. I was the only, uh, Yes, the only African American, you know, in my residency class, and um, in my year, in my year, and uh, and it was a lovely woman who made up the schedule for our class, and for like two years in a row, you know, she's trying to dole out the holidays, right? Who has holiday coverage and whatever? For two years in a row, I was put. Um, on call on Martin Luther King Day. And it was just, it, it was, and she usually tried to move things around. And if I jokingly kind of called her out on it, I said, I'm the only black resident. Um, and for two years in a row, you know, you put me on, you know, MLK Day for holiday coverage. <laughs> and she's like, Oh, my gosh, you know, and she felt so bad. Mm -hmm. And but, but I speak to that, or I mentioned that just to speak to the unconscious, I mean, yeah. on her level, you know, just, okay, here's a black holiday, you know, and just kind of associating the black, I don't know, I don't know what happened in her head. And I'm sure she doesn't know what happened in her head, but, right. you know, things like that. And, and it's a, a small thing to call out someone. But it was the beginning of, I think, me calling out things in my professional life. Uh, and, uh, um, and then certainly when I was an attending, uh, I actually was working in an outpatient clinic that had a very large segment uh, in, in that population where we were located, African-American community. And this was a place, uh, the, the institution where I worked, had multiple psychiatric outpatient clinics that were for different ethnic groups, populations. They had a Portuguese clinic. They had a Latino clinic. They had um, uh, like a S Southeast Asian kind of clinic. Uh, so they, they looked at these segments and they had others too, in addition to that. But they didn't have an African-American clinic. And, and it and some people may think, oh, okay, well, that makes sense because they're not a, a different ethnicity, so to speak, in terms of a language. I think they were looking mm -hmm. at it language-based. Uh, that's how that they made these clinics. But also looking at the different culture uh, uh, right. within that these groups experienced. So it wasn't all about language. It was also that they had a different take on mental health and and um and they 
staffed those clinics with people who understood that. So people who spoke the language or looked like the, the clients and, you know, the patients who would come through those clinics so that the patients would feel more at ease and so that they would feel mm -hmm. that someone actually understood them on some level. And, uh, and I remember going to the uh, department head and saying, why don't we have an African-American clinic? <laughs> you know, and, and um, we, so we eventually got an African-American clinic. <laughs> and I was made the head of that team. I mean, we, we were, we had an African-American outpatient team and I was made, you know, the head of that team and it was staffed with African-American, you know, uh, physicians and social workers, but it uh, just, people don't stop to think about these things yeah. um, unless they're brought up and they're usually having to be brought up, of course, by the person of color uh, because it's just not on the radar at all. Well, that's, um, yeah, it's like yeah. everything is default white in this country yeah. Yeah. unless proven otherwise. So we have to, right. yeah, and, and white people don't realize that because it's default white. So, yeah. so Absolutely. And, and for anyone listening who doesn't understand what I'm talking about, the culture of whiteness, it's a thing, and I'm referring to it in a sort of, not ironic way, but I'm aware of the ridiculousness of it as I'm saying this, the, yeah. the defaultness of the white. So what was it like navigating being the black voice, as you called it um, when we were talking before? How, right. How was that? <laughs> that that's is often level very of frustrating. <laughs> So, so those of us who have often been uh, the black voice, because we're the only person of color in the room, say, you know, if it, oftentimes, if it was a discussion about uh, before, say before this team, so if I was on, in a committee meeting, or anything that, or some other team, or, or uh, if it was a black patient, um, who may have had some particular uh, issue that maybe hinted around some sort of uh, uh, something to do with their race. It, if, 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 and it usually was if they presented themselves as having an issue around their race. So if they were very vocal, if they were being belligerent or aggressive or what mm -hmm. have you, then um, I was, if I was the only black person in the room, uh, I was then turned to as the authority. I was then the authority. And this mm. happens time and time and time and time again for those of us uh, who are people of color in these kind of positions. And it's so exhausting. And because oftentimes what happens is that that's the only time when we're heard. We're not, we're overlooked for other ideas that we might have or other input that could be valuable to the team or to a department or to, in, in, to leadership, um, that, that our voices are only brought out when it's convenient or our uh, expertise is really relegated to this small segment, um, the color segment, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so it's, it is exhausting and frustrating and, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so how, tell me how, cause this is for me, as I've been learning about racism and realizing that racism, the, the concept of racism being like one one person saying something nasty or thinking something nasty about another person based on the color of their skin. That's what I always thought racism was. And I think that's still what most of our society thinks that racism is until they learn, I'm sorry, most of white society, um, until they learn that it's a systemic issue. And, and for me, something that, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I felt like, oh, okay, like I don't have to hide and pretend like I'm perfect or would never think or think anything bad, like everyone's around it. The whole society is racist. Everyone it's, it's, we're, we're racialized by being in this society. Mm -hmm. So it takes the like personal 
I don't want to say take the personal blame off because obviously what you do with that knowledge and how you behave in the world is your own, is your own uh, responsibility. But it took this like pressure off of, of being able to admit it and just say, Oh, okay. Like we've all had, Mm. we all are in the same swimming in the same water and and breathing the same air together. Um, And it's affected all white people in a similar way. And then people of color in a, in a completely different way, but also learning that people of color have internalized racism against other people of color. And I, you know, I've, I've been told that um, uh, a a woman that I've worked with who is um, Caribbean said that she had to get over her own racism about African-American people and, and, and Ibram Kendi in his book, how to be an anti-racist talks about um, like the African immigrants that he met in New York, that dynamic between African-Americans and, and, and in reverse as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I can't speak to that at all. I can just say what I've heard from other people of color, but, but can you speak to that a little bit and, and what that does to you as a person of color? How do you, how do you reconcile that? And how do you process that? Right. And I don't know why I'm forgetting. Uh, There is actually a a document that uh, speaks to this. And I'll have to go back and maybe uh, I can find it and you can put it in the session notes after. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. But uh, some of that idea of, of having this kind of internal within uh the 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 group of people of color and particularly with african americans and with africans like african slaves when they came over um this this idea of um was this idea of divisiveness within the group uh uh many people attribute it to to the the white plantation owners really uh, being fearful of of an uprising mm. of of uh, their black slaves that that to so rather than have this kind of uh, cohesive group that could potentially overthrow them or take over and revolt and and all of that create these these divisions within them. So you have the house slaves and you have the the field slaves. And oftentimes the field slaves were much darker in skin color than the house slaves. Mm-hmm. And the house slaves, you know, because of, you know, the, the white plantation owners, you know, raping their female slaves and having these lighter colored babies now. And and so having having these kind of things, uh um these in the house slaves were often treated better. I'm not even going to say more humanely. I mean, just slightly better yeah. because they were not treated humanely regardless, but, but uh, somewhat better and might've had slightly uh, 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 greater privileges than, than the field slaves. And so, so you create this kind of jealousy within the ranks of slaves. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and of course, as the, the, the slaves who were lighter in color uh, and maybe had features that were more uh, Eurocentric uh, with, you know, maybe straighter hair or thinner lips or a more narrow nose, you know, these kinds of things, mm-hmm. these became more highly prized. And, and uh, and even for the, uh, and so this, this grew from there and, and continues because once again, the idea of the, the Eurocentric white ideal is what is held up as um, what all should aspire to. And, and so, so with the idea of the internalized racism that happens for many of us in uh, who are people of color, uh, we, in order to navigate society, and this is this happens, and I have to stress this happens on a subconscious or unconscious yeah. 
basis because it's endemic in our society. It's in everything that we're exposed to. It's in our advertising. It's in our uh, books. It's in it's throughout our uh, um, languaging. It's it's throughout the products that are created. It's through mm -hmm. everything that is part of the American culture is really geared towards this Eurocentric is view and Eurocentric um, uh, epitome of, of beauty, of intelligence, of wealth, of all of these things are, are, are for, for the white people, really. And, and so, because that's who held the power. Yeah. And, and so, um, in order for for people of color, and certainly I can speak, you know, for myself, this is something that you, in order to move ahead in this world and and try to thrive in this world, you often will will uh, it's it's so internalized it becomes part of your uh, way of operating and navigating the world. It just, it just is. And to do otherwise, you, you know that if you don't aspire to the white and Eurocentric view of, of how you should behave, how you should uh, um, look, uh, and this is changing a bit, this is changing a bit, but uh, that, that you can't get ahead in this world. You can't provide uh, in the ways that you might want to for your family, for yourself, for your family, for your children. Um, and, and it's very interesting. I, uh, I, I came across when I was looking at uh, this, uh, when, when we were talking about my coming on, I came across this book chapter I just wanted to mention, um, What is Internalized Racism by uh, Donna Bivens. And uh, the book is uh, Flipping the Script, White Privilege and Community Building. And uh, uh, she, she points out three major things that are really important to understand and address internalized racism. And one of those is that, uh, and I'll just read what uh, she's written, but as people of color are victimized by racism, we internalize it. That is, we develop ideas, beliefs, actions and behaviors that support or collude with racism. So even though we're against this idea of racism and we, we don't want to be uh, subjected to that, we, we have internalized it so much that our own behaviors mm. continue to support it on a, on a subconscious way. And um, because it's, it's a systemic issue this is because it's 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 in it's in the air we breathe it's in the water we drink it's mm -hmm. in everything and um and so she goes on to say individuals institutions and communities of color are often unconsciously and habitually rewarded for supporting white privilege and power and punished and excluded when we do not which is uh you know part of why the system uh, is perpetuated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then another point that she says, uh, her second point is because internalized racism is a systemic oppression, it must be distinguished from human wounds like self-hatred or low self-esteem to which all people are vulnerable. Mm. Uh, and it is important to understand it as systemic because it makes it clear that it is not a problem simply of individuals. It is structural. And so, uh, so I think that that's a really important distinction to make as well. And then thirdly, she uh, points out that internalized racism negatively impacts people of color 
intraculturally and cross-culturally because race and so that intraculturally that's what we're talking about those kind of subdivisions within a, a, an ethnic group or within say african-american uh, communities because race is a social and political construct that comes out of particular histories of domination and exploitation between peoples people of colors internalized racism often leads to great conflict among and between them as other concepts of power, such as ethnicity, culture, nationality, and class are collapsed in misunderstanding. So, so I think that really, uh, uh, this goes back to, to the idea of creating these hierarchies, even within say African Amer American communities or Afro Caribbean communities mm -hmm. or you know things like that. You, you you still have this hierarchy of who's who's better, you know, uh, who's closer to that Eurocentric ideal, um, because yeah. that's what better is. Yeah. God, if we could harness the amount of energy spent on white people trying to keep it that way and on the the people of color have spent trying to fit that yeah if we could take that amount of energy right. it's just amazing to think what we could create in this world or could have created and and that's a whole other subject i guess um so we're, we're almost out of time what i would love to do i'm going to ask you some questions that i actually didn't prepare you for and i just thought of them but um what advice do you have for any two for biracial children listening um or people who are potential parents of biracial children it's, it's two different things but what would you tell a parent of a biracial child advice on raising them so that they don't have to to minimize the struggles that they face and what advice would you give to biracial children themselves um, about finding their way in this in this systemically racist world right so i think you know to parents certainly um, understand that your children are straddling uh, uh, you know, two sides of the fence and to really expose them to ideas uh, in a very positive way of both cultures, regardless of what cultures are coming from. Mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, because you're going to have to counter you really are going to have to counter the the eurocentric uh view that is your uh that white is is best uh uh that because it's going to be presented in every way possible to mm -hmm. your child so yeah. you really have to make a point of of uh, being mindful of that and really try to present a much more balanced view. And for for kids who are biracial and finding your way, understand that you, it, the deck has been stacked against you, <laughs> and but but you can overcome this. You can understand that you are wonderful and beautiful and uh, magnificent as you are. You uh and and really you know look if if you can't turn to your parents really take it upon yourself to find a, a mentor uh who who can give you positive advice positive views of yourself give you an experience of of say if if you're african american and you're looking for a black mentor finding someone uh who is may look like you and and can say and help uplift you help you navigate uh and and be a role model that uh that you might not otherwise have access to that's beautiful thank you that's such great advice i um i love i mean i think we all need to hear that we're beautiful and wonderful exactly as we are but but uh, particularly in this context Dr. Melissa Hankins, you're amazing. And I know that everyone listening is gonna to wanna to get a little bit more of what you're, pick more up of what you're putting down. So how can people find you? How can people work with you? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna put all of this stuff in the show notes too, um, but 
but share how people can yes. find you, any programs you've got going on. So people can uh, come and check me out. I'm on LinkedIn uh, under Dr. Melissa Hankins and uh, and also on Facebook, my, my company is uh, Melissa Hankins Coaching. So on Facebook, I'm M Hankins Coaching. Uh, so you can check me out there and my website, melissahankinsmd.com. And uh, uh, I'm, I certainly work with people. I have a free consultation if people want to uh, be in touch with me about doing some coaching and tapping because I incorporate tapping, which has been so instrumental in my own sense of um, helping me to come to terms with who I am, my identity, and, and loving me on all of my levels. And, and so I think that that is so, uh, it's, it's fundamental in all of the work that I do with other people as well. Awesome. I feel like we could, we, we can and should do an entire other interview about tapping. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I'd love to. thank you again for sharing your story, your perspectives, your, your light and your beauty and your knowledge and all of the things uh, with, with me today and, and always, and then with, with anyone who was listening to this um, either on YouTube or in the podcast um, is just such a, such a pleasure and a, a privilege to be able to privilege in a good way to be able to uh, learn from you. <laughs> so um, thank you again. And, yes, my uh, pleasure. I, thank uh, you. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. All right.